Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 7th Asia-Pacific Climate Change Adaptation Forum. My name is Noel, and I will be your technical facilitator today to ensure that you have a smooth experience with Zoom. You are at the session titled Overcoming the Tragedy of Horizon Through Climate Resilience and Economic Planning Processes. We will begin in just a moment here, but before we get started, we would like to let you know this meeting will be recorded for documentation purposes. Furthermore, your participation using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen is highly encouraged. The chat box is also available in case you have any perspectives you'd like to share or if you need to reach out for me, to me for technical assistance. For those of you who are just joining us, welcome. You are at the session titled Overcoming the Tragedy of Horizon Through Climate Resilience in Economic Planning Process. We are ready to get started. I will now pass the floor to Coco Warner, Manager at Impacts Vulnerability and Risk Subprogram at the Adaptation Program at the UNFCCC. Coco, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and good morning, good evening, everyone, or good day, depending on where you are um, across the world. We'd really like to welcome you to this session. As all of you know, we have this tremendous moment of decision. Um, countries across the world are faced with, um, that are right in the middle of the pandemic. Many countries are knee deep in all kinds of weather related and climate related stressors. And it's a moment of rebuilding and recovery. And each country, as well as municipalities, cities, institutions like your own, are faced with the question, how will we rebuild and how will we recover? Most people's attention is of course on the immediate, what's happening now, which is for many people, either the pandemic or some kind of disruption. But of course, the opportunity as we raise our eyes to the horizon is to look towards a resilient future and to ask ourselves, what will we do? How will we invest in order to ensure a resilient and, and economically stable and promising future for the people that we work with in our communities. I'm really excited today um, to introduce you to panelists who are gonna um, share a lot of their experience and knowledge um, from countries around the world. Before we do that, we just have a poll to find out a little bit more about you and we'll throw that up. Let me just go through the outline of what we'll do in this hour together at, at our joint session with um, the Asian Development Bank and the UNFCCC. First, we'll hear after the poll from our panelists and we'll have a discussion with them. You'll have a brief chance to get involved in that discussion. Followed by that, we'll have discussions and again, another discussion at the end. And that will be our very brief time together today. Um, let me outline some of the objectives for this session. Um, we will be looking at, hold on just a moment, I beg your pardon. So the objectives of this session are to ask a few questions about national adaptation plans. Um, and planning processes that contribute to those NATs, as we call them in the UNFCCC, to strengthen them and identify priorities that can steer local and global economic development in resilient directions. Again, as I said, especially as we move through the pandemic and find out what's on the other side. Second, um, we know that economic resilience requires socioeconomic socioeconomic planning to factor in the long-term climate risk uh, considerations and also the uncertainty that's no easy task for planners. Um, what changes are needed and many of you might be working on planning or plans and so we're really interested in your interaction with our panelists to find out what changes are needed in planning processes to accommodate these longer term uncertainties and risks. And then third, how can infrastructure planning be strengthened to promote resilient design, implementation, and operations of those infrastructure systems to, re to deliver um, resilient economic uh, services that are really in some ways that, that foundation 
of a safe and stable and good life for people in the societies in which we live. Okay, so that's the direction that we're going. Um, would you like to, for, for our technical support, would you like to put up the poll before we start so that we can find out a little bit more about our audience today? Okay, now as everybody sees this, go ahead and just fill it out as well as our panelists. That also might be relevant for you. Super. We'll just give you a moment. And with that, shall we begin? And here we see the results. Let me just run through those. A bit more than, well, almost 60% of us in the audience today come from international um, organizations. Another big group are governments and NGOs. We have a few consultants with us, as well as researchers and academia. So it's wonderful to have everyone with us today. Um, and maybe I could just get started with, with a few uh, reflections about climate change and economic impacts. And then we'll get to the real show, which all of you have come to. And I'm sure you really want to know um, what all of our panelists and their, their experiences have been with adaptation plans. Um, maybe just to get started, climate change, of course, poses long-term risks to all of society and we don't know exactly how climate change will interact with all of the economic, with the real economy, um, not only GDP and what sometimes fancy academics call the social cost of carbon, but what will climate change risks mean for fiscal policy? Um, what do we do with taxes and subsidies and all kinds of policies that affect the fiscal side. Um, what will happen with monetary policy? Will climate change interact with interest rates and lending and all of those things on the monetary side? And maybe um, very practically, what does climate change mean for real estate markets, for property value, more important than anything for jobs, for the safety of people? National adap adaptation planning and plans present a very vital tool for countries and municipalities and organizations like yours, as I said before, to look out to the horizon, to anticipate changes that might be coming and to find out how would those changes affect what's important to my constituents, to my country, my territory, my town, um, to a particular demographic. And planning provides a tool that helps account for those risks, engage with societies in a dialogue about priorities, what's important, and also sequencing what needs to happen first and second and third, and then of course, implementation. In the UNFCCC process, national adaptation plans are a very important tool for countries to articulate their priorities and then, among many other things, to go to international finance institutions, national finance institutions, and discuss investments in adaptation and in building resilience. And those plans really are a foundation of a spectrum of tools of preempting risk, of planning for it, and then building for a, for a resilient, hopefully shockproof future where contingency plans can also be put into place. So what's needed? I noticed about 6% of you are, are in think tanks or academia and research. So there, there are some key things that we still need to know. And hopefully you can help us as we move forward in adaptation planning for resilience. And I'm just gonna mention five areas. And there are also questions that, that planners are trying to take into account. So the first question is, what are the distributional impacts of climate-related shocks and stressors over time? 
we need to know more about the spatial dis distributional impacts, distributional impacts on different groups of people and different sectors. That's something that we'll talk about here and impacts over time. So what are the distributional impacts? Second, we need a critical assessment of valuation and societal risk tolerance. Um, what do we value? What kinds of infrastructures do we value? How do we value biodiversity and ecosystems that support human existence? And how do we value risk? How much risk is a society able and willing to tolerate? Those things play a really key role in planning for resilience because resilience involves a wide variety of things and risk tolerance is often one of the central parts of what is resilient for the people who are experiencing risk. Third, perhaps there are financial innovations on the horizon that you can help us learn about that will be a tool for adaptation planning um, that allow uh, the financial resources to be invested in those places that will yield the greatest gains for, for societal resilience. Obviously, we want to know more about what you're experiencing and what kinds of policy tools you are using with success or maybe not with success. Sometimes we don't talk about things that we've tried that haven't worked out. So we need to find out more about the use of policy tools for adaptation plans. And then fifth, we obviously need to also know more about the interactions with climate change impacts and other market dynamics on different asset classes, geographies, and sectors. So we have a very big work agenda ahead of us. And now we're going to turn our, our, our attention to the experiences of three wonderful panelists who I will introduce now um, to find out what they're doing with national adaptation plans, perhaps any challenges that they're facing, as well as where they're making good progress. So if I, if I may, let me transition to our first presenter, who is Li Huang An. Um, Li is from the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development of Vietnam. She's also an active negotiator in the UNFCCC negotiations, looking at a range of topics, including adverse impacts of climate change, or we call that loss and damage. Um, she also covers adaptation and mitigation. And she's, again, with the government of Vietnam. So Lee, perhaps we could hear from you and then I'll go on afterwards and also introduce Mary and Yihong. Looking forward to hearing your comments. Hello, good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Coco, for introduction. It is an honor for me to be here today as the first presenter of the section to present the Vietnam experience in adaptation planning in the agriculture sector. So, uh, Hamas, could you please help to share my, uh, okay, is there, uh, my uh, presentation? So I will present the Vietnam's experiences in adaptation planning in the agriculture sector. That is uh, critical for food security and livelihood of the country. Next, please. So as uh, addressed in the economic sector resilient outlooks, adaptation planning seeks to enable adaptation actions through a wide range of strategy, plans, policies, and regulation in Vietnam as well. You can see strengthening of climate uh, policy and governance in the economic sector are increasingly recognizing the importance of action at system level. In this slide, in the, on the left-hand side is a policy, in the middle is the actions, and the right-hand side is the requirement. So the adaptation plan in the agriculture sector, we call it NAPAC, uh, develops under the National Adaptation Plan, and it is the center of the Climate Change Action Plan of the country, where we focus 
on the mitigation, climate change adaptation, resource preparation, institution, and policy transparency. Very actively in the UN C, the country also approved the Paris Agre Agreement implementation plan since 2016. And then uh, we do the updated uh, NDC and resubmit it in last year, September, which is uh, we uh, highlight the core benefit between adaptation and mitigation. Disaster risk management is considered uh, together with the COVID-19 pandemic and other external risks. In the sectoral, at the sectoral level, climate change action plan and strategy of the sector in the context of social economic de development, we focus on the value added and climate change res resilient, uh, identified for the different level, national, sub, uh, national ecological reasons and subsectors. Um, so you can see the very uh, specific requirement in the policy development planning and process. Next, please. Um, so facing the tragedy, the action priority setting is highly consider, uh, considered in planning and in process, especially in the context of climate related disaster recovery and coronavirus disease recovery in every economic sector, including agriculture. Here, when we develop the uh, adaptation uh, plan, we develop um, five main selection criteria for the adaptive priority. You can see that technical and economical feasibility at the different level, small scale, medium scale, and large scale for the enterprise involvement. So for adaptation, uh, we do uh, take the ecological base and natural base solution as the most priority. Um, the option must be a cost benefit analysis with the um, uh, trans transparency policy for M and E, which is where, where we can track how effectively if we, in, uh, if we implement this action. And also we uh, do the optimal scalability potential for the action selected. Um, one of the advantage of the agriculture sector is the core benefit of the action between adaptation, mitigation, uh, uh, highly considered. So inside this uh, main criteria, there's a number of indicator has been developed for the selection. Next, please. Now I um, uh, would like to share with you some of the example for economically effective adaptation measure in Vietnam. Uh, we starting the climate change adaptation response uh, since uh, a number of years. And recently uh, there are some successful um, uh, we could achieve. Uh, the first example is a seasonal calendar adjustment um, based on the uh, climate suitability map for the rice in the spring crops in Mekong Delta area. Uh, it's only for rice and in the uh, spring crops because in this time, the Mekong Delta area in Vietnam are seriously affected by salinity intrusion and water shortage. So apply the climate uh, suitability map and a seasonal adjustment uh, in the area, we could uh, try to avoid the loss uh, reach to 33 million Vietnam dung per hectare per uh, crops. I mean, in only the spring crop. And this uh, potential um, for scalability of the action is could reach to 1,200 hectare. Uh, 
I think it's a very successful tool. Uh, this tool is uh, developed and supported by the ERI and CCAP in Vietnam since uh, 2018. And uh, nowadays, uh, it's uh, recommended to expand to other areas as well. So the second example is the stream, stream ride practice in coastal and middle zone in Mekong River Delta region. It's also the most vulnerable area with the water shortage and uh, salinity intrusion. So, um, uh, farmer do two crop season or three crop season nowadays is the rotation of right and stream, uh, or even uh, the stream after full rise crop. Uh, with this uh, action, we could read the scalability in the area up to 200 hectare with the, uh, with the reasonable, uh, not, I mean, even low required upfront cost and also in short time payment periods. And the uh, first example I would like to show here is uh, one of uh, a uh, few of example for agroforestry model. Uh, so we do see that agroforestry is the uh, is an uh, action that could have a last uh, core benefit um, between adaptation, mitigation, and also contribution to the food uh, security and livelihood. So the model of the coffee and forest or coffee with uh, fruit trees in central highland of Vietnam as a kind of a coffee avocado or cassia or durian is uh, applied. And uh, we do see that each kind of model has uh, its own potential for scaling up and also uh, low uh, required upfront cost and payment barriers is uh, uh, reasonable for the farmer in the area. So it is the, some of the successful example, but nowadays we continue to do uh, the planning adaptation for the next uh, periods of 10 years under the Paris Agreement. Next, please. Uh, continue to do the adaptation planning for the 10 years ahead. So I think that uh, we need to establish a clear mechanism to strengthen the coordination and communication between the national adaptation plan with the sectoral level. And uh, we, we would uh, like to improve the sectoral planners and value chain stakeholders are also involved in the process. Uh, vertically and horizontally in planning and budgeting because uh, adaptation is uh, sometimes go beyond our effort. So develop the guidelines to strengthen the coordination and communication of climate risks and response strategies at national and subnational levels are very important. We need to mainstreaming the, uh, the sectoral planning into the budgeting process of the country uh, it, to ensure that the action uh, have the, the, the finance uh, allocation to implement and strengthening a coherence or synergies among different programs in agriculture sector. For example, organic program or high tech or climate smart agriculture with other uh, uh, priority option like a natural based solution or ecological based solution are highly appreciated. Last but not least, we think that strengthening the international, regional, and South-South cooperation in implementing climate change action, especially in NDC implementation and national adaptation plan in agriculture sector is a need to be strengthened. Um, it's a, one of the reason that I would like to join in this, uh, um, in this uh, forum. So thank you very much for your attention. Lee, thank you so much, especially that last slide, the way forward was very informative. Um, one, so right now we're getting ready for Mary Kim, who I'll, I'll introduce shortly, but just as a transition, Lee, it was just so useful to hear about how in Vietnam you are 
trying to integrate or, or plan together both the budget as well as the national adaptation plan. And we really appreciated your insights. Very, very interesting. Let me transition to Mary Kim. Mary Kim is the Senior Programs Officer at the Asian Development Bank. Um, she has a wealth of experience and um, we're, we're particularly interested, Mary Kim, in some of the experiences that you've had last year and this year with COVID-19. What does that mean for resilience? Um, and what does that mean for adaptation plans? Mary Kim, over to you. And thanks again, Lee, that was wonderful. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction, Coco. And it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, I work at ADB's Pacific Liaison and Coordination Office um, in Sydney. And I'm excited to talk to you today uh, about um, the Pacific Private Sector Development Initiatives work on tourism planning and on um, towards resilience and um, economic resilience in particular. Now, I just wanted to see whether you can see my slides yet. No. Yep, we'll see you okay. Um, if you yep. can click present the view, that would be great. Brilliant. On the bottom right side. Yep. Thank you. Can you see it now? It's still in the uh, normal view. Oh, really? Okay. Okay, I hope you can see that now. Um, no. Okay, it's on my screen as a um, second. Okay, is that it now? I've, I've turned it off and on again. No, it's not. Uh, would you like me to share it for you, Mary? Yes, please. That would be great. Apologies. Okay, thanks very much for that, Noel. All right, so um, the Pacific Private Sector Development Initiative, or PSDI, was established in 2006 as a regional technical assistance facility to provide technical advice and capacity building across all 14 Pacific Island countries to improve um, business, just um, to improve the business enabling environment in, across the Pacific. The success of um, PSDI has meant that it's now in its fourth phase that commenced on the 1st of January with co-financing from ADB, the governments of Australia and New Zealand with the EU to join shortly. PSDI is, is, PSDI is actively working to support the region's recovery from the impacts of COVID-19. And you'll see that um, in the diagram to the right of the, the slide there that um, PSDI channels its support across a, a few focus areas and I won't go through them today because I want to focus on our work on tourism. So PSDI um, commenced work on tourism in February 2020 due to demand from um, the Pacific. So to date we've produced country tourism snapshots for um, all of the Pacific Island countries as well as um, a regional tourism assessment that takes into account COVID-19 impacts and developed a, a, a tourism work plan for PSDI. Um, to do this, we've been collaborating with development partners in the region, as well as the South Pacific Tourism Organization and other stakeholders. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So to carry out the work on tourism, it was and develop um, those products that we've produced so far, it was important for us to be cognizant of um, the 
specific tourism context. And in this slide, you'll see a list of the existing challenges for tourism planning in the Pacific that may also be relevant in other um, countries, in other regions. I'll highlight three in particular um, due to um, because I'm sure the, some of them are self-evident. So access to finance is important. So this is through development partners, through um, banks, if we're talking about micro, small, medium enterprises and um, small tourism operators, and access to finance could also come through domestic budgets through government. Um, another important consideration is transport connectivity. So international, inter-regional um, and domestic uh, Transport is very important um, to facilitate tourism in the Pacific. The other thing to consider that um, with any kind of work in the Pacific, we do need to be aware of the Pacific Islands remoteness, the small domestic markets and volatility to external shocks, including natural disasters and noting that disasters are expected to only increase in the Pacific, particularly um, with climate change. So if we go to the next slide, noting these, these challenges for Pacific tourism planning, um, in, after we commenced um, the planning, we were hit with COVID-19, which compounded the existing challenges for Pacific tourism, um, which, and which has meant that the tourism industry, like the rest of the world, is in hibernation. So the economic contraction in the Pacific region is 6.1%. So the tourism econo economies in the Pacific were the hardest hit. So um, you see there that there's been a 20% contraction for Fiji, but other um, Pacific Island countries have really found it tough, um, including Cook Islands, Vanuatu, Palau, Samoa, um, and Tonga as well as others. The, the hit that the tourism industry took exposed inefficiencies in proactive resilience planning and financing risk. And we, um, countries, and, and we realised that country tourism budgets were under pressure to support the industry during the hibernation. So um, there has been development partner support provided regionally and on a bilateral basis. And we saw that uh, when we were working with countries that limited data and systems in place to collect data has impeded tourism planning and full assessment of COVID-19 impact. So to go to the next slide, um, please, to put this into context, um, we'll go through the, the case study of Vanuatu where tourism contributes up to 60% of the GDP um, through direct and indirect economic impacts. Vanuatu um, on lots of um, world risk indexes is the most um, vulnerable country for natural disasters. So when we go back to um, 2020, a state of emergency was declared following COVID the COVID-19 outbreak. And this was followed closely by Tropical Cyclone Harold on 5 April. This is also recalling that um, Vanuatu was hit um, in 2015 by Cyclone Pam, from which the country is still recovering, um, is still recovering. So we see that in Vanuatu, um, different shocks, so we've got the the health shock of COVID-19 was compounded by the natural disaster shock. And they all that, and those came together to culminate in significant challenges for the tourism sector. In light of this, we see that um, resilience planning presents an opportunity and a risk. So opportunity to build back better, to be informed by good data and working in collaboration with partners and internally. And there is also a risk as well to, to plan the response too quickly and, and in a rush and repeat. Um, and, and sorry, and not seize opportunities um, from lessons learned. Um, we also saw in Vanuatu that existing tourism challenges and inequalities um, that came from 
the, the hibernation of the industry, which continues today. So if we go to the next slide, please. So we've been informed in PSDI by the experiences of the tourism sector across the Pacific, including Vanuatu, um, which has meant that PSDI's work plan has um, is actively prioritising the integration of resilience um, into tourism planning and the sector's recovery from COVID-19. So this entails, as you will see in the slide, evidence-based planning, so um, drawing on as well as establishing climate and disaster risk da data, developing robust indicators that are vital for tourism policy and planning, and enhance cultural and environmental indicators to support sustainability. Um, we're looking into crisis disaster management to build resilience. So working with countries to make sure that they um, have a proactive approach on crisis and disaster management and planning through regional experience sharing. The third um, lesson for us was to, for our work plan was to finance sustainable tourism and that, make, um, in, that involves uh, establishing and um, developed, developing tailored financial products for the tourism sector, reassessing tourism taxes. So we know that there are um, levies that are in place in Fiji, for example, the environment and climate, the environment and climate adaptation levy that's there, uh, or use for services that um, are in place in Palau. And we're also going to work with countries to investigate new ways to finance risk from disasters and look to draw on blue financing mechanisms as well. So not just land-based looking towards the oceans. The other thing that um, we want to make sure that we're doing is we want to draw on the, on the private sector. So looking at the, um, PSTI's overarching objective of making it easier to do business in the Pacific. We want to have, um, work with countries to create a more streamlined um, enabling environment, including regulatory improvements and digital innovation. So I'll end um, the presentation there uh, and highlight that you know, the Pacific region is vulnerable to multiple shocks, including health that we've seen, as well as um, natural disasters. So it, this will require concerted efforts on resilience planning to build back better. Um, and that's linked to financing, uh, collaboration, innovation, and working closely with partners. Thank you. And if you'd like any more information, um, please visit our website, um, adbpsdi.org. Thanks, Coco. Yeah, Mary Kim, that was really interesting. Thank you so much. And you've also provided a very perfect bridge to our next speaker, um, Ye Hong Wong, who is a senior investment officer at the Asian Development Bank. Um, and and I, I love the bridge, Mary Kim, because that last point that you were talking about, you also give some very specific examples um, of evidence-based planning and some of the challenges of the uncertainty that climate change brings for, for adaptation plans in sectors like agriculture, like tourism. Um, and then that last couple of examples for uh, with taxes and what you do to make sure that tourism, a key sector for many countries, is sustainable. Those are just very, very practical. Now, Yi Hong, moving over to you, um, you're an expert in finance. What can you tell us about finance maybe some innovations or tools that you're seeing being used and, um, and what that means for adaptation planning. And for everyone, we're running just a little bit over time. So if our remaining two speakers, who are Yi Hong and Simon, who I'll introduce, um, if you could just be very concise, that will give us enough time to move through and, and allow people to interact with you. So Yi Hong, over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Coco, and good morning, everyone. My pleasure to join you all in a forum today. Uh, so I'd like to share an ADB non-sovereign project in China as a case study 
to improve uh, resilience uh, through urban water infrastructure. Next slide, please. Let me start by just giving you a bit of background on the sector. The PRC is one of the world's most water stressed countries. Water scarcity is exacerbated by climate change, which intensifies um, these extreme precipitation events, strain drainage and sewage infrastructure and heightens the risk of urban flooding. So enhancing the Climate resilience is an emerging priority for cities in the PRC, and cities are willing to plan for and develop integrated solutions with smart water and climate resilient techniques such as Sponge City. So the ADP project will support Shenzhou Water Group and its subsidiary to invest in multiple water supply and wastewater treatment facilities with smart water components and climate resilient water infrastructure. Shenzhou Water is a leading water company in China and operates on the commercial principles. The ADB is providing a 10 year loan of 200 million, including 100 million of co-financing from international insurers. And the ADB loan proceeds will be used 40% uh, for Shenzhen, which is the third largest um, city in China and also the home uh, market for Shenzhen water. And the remaining 60% uh, will be used for sub-project in the third and fourth tier cities where we see a strong uh, demand. Um, so all the sub-projects will need to meet the criteria, uh, elig eligibility criteria. Uh, for example, the sub-projects will be screened against a detailed list of smart water and climate resilient techniques. So as to the contractual arrangements, the sub-projects will be developed based on public-private partnerships with the municipal governments. So the non-financial value additions ADB is bringing to the project includes um, the mainstreaming climate change adaptation, gender mainstreaming, improvement of uh, social and environmental management and knowledge sharing to replicate the project. Uh, next uh, slide, please. To, to scale up digital solution in the economic sector resilience, the project promotes smart water management, such as remote sensors, hydraulic modeling, a big data processing, online payments, and forecasting and earning warning for urban uh, flooding. Next uh, slide, please. So um, just to touch upon the sponge city concept, uh, it is about absorbing, harvesting, uh, uh, storing, filtering and purifying, and then slowly releasing or reusing the urban runoffs. Uh, its planning is guided by the modeling of surface water, weather patterns, drainage system, and groundwater. Sponge city construction involves a series of infrastructure that can mitigate uh, impacts from floods and droughts through the artificial and the nature-based solution. So in the PRC has launched a national sponge city program in uh, 2015 and currently 13 pilot smart cities projects are under implementation. Next slide, please. So the ADP projects will uh, also promote various low impact development techniques, such as, you know, as shown on this uh, chart, uh, the use of wetland or permeable pavements, rainwater gardens, green roofs, storage facilities, wastewater reuse, and management aquifer recharge. So in short, these technologies can help reduce the severity of urban flooding by storing and releasing any excessive runoff in a more ecologically functional way. Yeah, if we go to the last slide, please. So there are several key lessons I learned from the project preparation. Uh, first, um, 
from ADB, we are providing a so-called one ADB solution to bring the best of our um, transactional and sector, um, sector expertise, which helps to structure a non-sovereign financing in the new areas of uh, adaptation, mainstreaming in the water sector. And second is that the well-structured Sponge City PPP contract against predetermined performance indicators help to improve the bankability of adaptation projects. And in addition, an integrated approach covering the full water value chain, including water, wastewater, and sponge city is also uh, highly encouraged. And the third point is that smart water management accelerates the, re re the, the transition towards the, re the use, the more sustainable use of water and the first uh, lessons learned, the first point is that um, the peer-to-peer -peer learning among cities and kind of knowledge transfer among cities is helpful to enhance the local government's climate conscious in their economic recovery post the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. And that's all from me today. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Yi Hong. I, these, these examples of water and how you're using some, I'm not a water specialist, but how you're using some of these traditional ideas of, for example, sponge city isn't necessarily traditional, but it does make a lot of sense, even for a non-specialist like me, how you're combining that with data and, and smart analytics is really fascinating. And it's, again, a wonderful precursor for our fourth and final panelist on this section of the program, Simon Lucas. Simon, I read in your biography that you think that a lot of the tools for adaptation planning in sectors such as water already exist, and that one of the keys now is to integrate them. And thank you so much, Yi Hong, for highlighting how, um, how we can actually do that. Simon, let me quickly just read out your very impressive title and then over to you. We're super excited to hear what you have to say. Everyone, Simon is resilience and inclusive team leader and the Asian Climate Sherpa um, in the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office of the United Kingdom. And of course, Simon, your, your colleagues are very important counterparts for the UNFCCC as we start gearing up towards our COP26. So it's wonderful um, that you can join us. And please, we're curious to hear for the next couple of minutes about your experiences with adaptation plans and resilience. Over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much. And um, I should just mention that the COP president was here in Nepal recently. So we had the opportunity to really show in the impacts of climate change uh, in the region and the very real impacts, particularly on the glaciers of the Himalayas. So uh, really timely um, uh, visit from him. Um, and also a good way of leading into what the work we're doing. And I can't emphasize enough that this is a really joint effort in Nepal with other development partners. Um, so if I share my presentation, hopefully you can see, uh, see the slides coming on. Let me know if not. Yep, we can we can see them. Maybe just put them in the full screen yep. mode, and then we'll be perfect. Okay, um, so I'll move swiftly on because I know time is short. Um, but I just want to run through what we're doing with de other development partners in the government of Nepal to make sure that uh, the recovery builds in resilience. And luckily, the government of Nepal uh, established a three-hour committee uh, at the start of the COVID pandemic. Um, that focus on relief, recovery, and resilience. So they already had resilience in their minds. So we're pushing it an open door. Uh, and it's rare that um, uh, those thoughts are there about how to make sure that future uh, impacts or earthquakes or the multiple shocks that the pool faces are built in. Um, and a quick bit about how we're developing a tool to measure the impact on specifically on resilience of um, these interventions. Um, and then a final lesson. So just a quick run through. This is uh, what we started with, uh, relief, recovery and resilience. Uh, as I say, that builds you know, the short term response, uh, but has a view in the longer term that we don't want to um, do short term relief operations that interfere with market systems, agriculture systems 
or make people so destitute that they can't build their own resilience. And then there was a lot of enthusiasm to look at whether we could also make that response um, more green. Um, and there's a lot of debate about what that really means. But we've got a very simple way of describing it in Nepal that actually Nepal has a lot of natural assets that if developed sustainably can lead to sustainable growth. Uh, now that happens to be low carbon, um, but it won't by itself be resilient unless we think about it. And I won't go all through all the sectors, uh, but two sectors in particular are particularly important uh, to make that response and that green growth uh, resilient. First of all, there's a lot of investment going in in various types of infrastructure, from hydropower to solar, uh, lots of roads, uh, new airports. All these all these infrastructure investments are both opportunities for short-term job creation, but also uh, opportunities to build in resilience. So we really have to work hard in a country that's very prone to natural disasters already to make sure that the additional incremental investments are really made to ensure that those are um, long-term investments. And a particular focus on the urban environment where Nepal is just starting the process of urbanization, I would say. So there's a real opportunity to help that urbanization become really, really resilient, as I say, in a country with lots of uh, for flooding, landslides, etc., and to make sure that that development is also sustainable environmentally and avoids the sort of dirty development paradigm of the 20th century. The third area that we're specifically looking on at is, uh, not surprisingly, uh, immediate vulnerability reduction for those affected by COVID, both the economic impact of returning migrants, for example, but also those affected directly. So resilient health systems is very important. We recognize that within this program of recovery, building response, shock responsive social protection systems is critical. Um, at the moment, there's no single registry, for example, so it's very hard to mobilize large cash transfers through the government systems at the moment. So lots to do there. But also making sure that we've got the right uh, financial architecture ready to support interventions uh, when shocks happen, uh, but also prioritize adaptation investments prevent the magnitude of those shocks being larger. So there's work going on on loss and damage calculations to make the economic case for increased in government investment and donor investment in those areas. And then finally, a whole chunk around using new technology, whether it be um, satellite mapping for weather forecasting, climate forecasting, more innovative tools for making payments when shocks happen, and free payments so that people can prepare, all those things that are, are now possible. Uh, and then I, I would say that the, uh, the, the fourth area is around the private sector, where we recognize there's an important role for new technology around agricultural crops, risk insurance mechanisms, the private sector has to play, um, but uh, there isn't time to go through all of that. Uh, and just to sort of uh, map out the scale um, of the interventions, on the relief side, there's about 800 million committed. And then recovery already committed is around 4 billion in green recovery other sectors I was talking about earlier. And then around two and a half billion uh, for building resilience into the system in the longer term. So as I say, this is a joint, all the development partners, the ADB, the World Bank, um, IFC, EU, um, the UK, um, USAID, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, all the conventional development partners are involved. But then very quickly, I just wanted to, um, this is a uh, resilience measuring framework that we've been developing uh, for our program. Uh, to try and unbundle that thorny problem of everybody recognizes resilience when they see it, but it's really hard to measure. Uh, and I know there's all sorts of frameworks out there, but we're really trying to simplify it to a system that local governments can use and we can scale up to the national level. On the left-hand side, you can see the interventions, the direct ones and the, um, the indirect ones, and, and then the way they impact on building resilience. And we found it very useful to break that resilience down to the resilience people involved, the direct beneficiaries of an early warning system, for example, but recognizing that they also rely on the services, whether it's health or education or infrastructure services such as water supply. And then the importance of resilience institutions, and that's in a country uh, like Nepal, which has just gone through a lot of changes on the governance side. We need, to do, we need to support the new disaster management agency, but we also need to support the new local governments and provincial governments that have just been formed in Nepal 
develop that capacity to build people. And, and then, as the title suggests, just uh, um, one final slide to say uh, it's a truism in the uh, sort of DRR sector we should never make waste an emergency crisis. It was Churchill who said this the first time round. Um, but in a country where there is no such thing as a black swan event, there are black swan events, there are crises every year. We just don't know how big or where they will be or how severe. So it's really important to keep ramming home this message in all of our economic planning and development work that actually resilience isn't an add-on, it's an essential component. And that goes back to that introduction that we know how to do most of this stuff. Yes, there are innovations at the outside edges, but we know how to do a lot of this stuff. It just lacks the political will and the investment. We have to use it, issues like COVID to really drive home that these investments can also um, make every country like Nepal less prone to the other shocks that they are bound to happen again in the future whether it be economic or earthquake, flood, fire, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you very much. Well, Simon, thank you so much. That was a really compelling, just a couple of points that, that really came out to me was this never waste a moment. I was also astounded um, to learn about the, the level of investment. You mentioned four billion. Um, investing in that kind of medium term recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. And earlier you'd also mentioned the, the, the targeting of that recovery as an opportunity to invest in job creation, green job creation. So I'm mean, just a, a quick question and everyone, we have two things. I'm gonna ask Simon a question, then we're gonna ask all of you a poll and then we have two more discussants. And then finally, um, you'll notice I compressed our timekeeping um, so that we'll, we'll stay on track. We wanna leave a lot of time for everyone to, to discuss. So we'll have our two discussants and then go to an extended Q&A. So Simon, just a question. You mentioned that 4 billion for medium term recovery and then an additional two plus billion for the longer term resilience building. How does that, is that small change? Is that a really significant amount of money? These days we're all talking about billions and trillions and I lose track a little bit of the magnitude, but how significant is that medium term investment in recovery? And how significant is that, that focus on the opportunity to create green jobs and investments that really lay that, that path towards a more resilient and adaptive future. Just a, a quick reflection on your part. Yeah, so to put it in context, the NDC sets out a resource requirement of around 25 billion to meet its adaptation and mitigation needs. So 7 billion is the total figure um, from the development partners. So it's a chunk, but it's not the whole picture by any means uh, and the government itself um, as committing around a similar amount, um, but that only gets us up to 14, 15, and that leaves a chunk of nine, uh, where we know the private sector has a crucial role to play. So um, in theory, it should split down roughly third, third, third. Um, in reality, we know in the longer term that the biggest chunk of trucks start coming from the private sector, mobilizing, um, those resources to mitigate risks on the insurance side, but also mobilize the green finance um, for the bigger energy projects. And that will allow donor and particularly government finance to focus on more on the public goods side. Um, so that's the, that's the work that we're now doing is how do you actually structure a green recovery plan that is not just about public finance. There's a big focus so far on most green recovery plans has been let's mobilize, let's spend the money that we have in the treasury, uh, rather than how do we mobilize the private sector as it comes out of, um, of lockdowns and travel restrictions and all the rest. Uh, and so I was very interested in the, in the tourism presentation earlier, which again is a big earner for Nepal, completely devastated. And they were, you know, they were supposed to be visiting Nepal year 2020. So um, you can imagine how disappointed all of the tourism entrepreneurs are there. But how do we help them build back better, uh, make their tourism investments more sustainable, and particularly make sure that the environment that 
Nepal's tourism relies on isn't damaged by the infrastructure investments. And there's a real trade-off there um, that we need to work through. That's the, uh, the rough support. Yeah, thank you so much. And I just can't resist Lee, Mary Kim, and Yi Hong. Each one of you had also commented on different elements. And um, I welcome any, any responses to Simon. Lee, for example, you mentioned that integration of budgets and adaptation plans. Mary Kim, of course, um, you had some very salient examples of what, what it means to help the tourism sector in many Pacific Island states become more sustainable, just again, because that sector is so important for the wider economy. And then Hong, with your examples of smart investment in water, um, do you see any of these trends that Simon is talking about in the countries that you work with? I don't know if any of you want to comment now. We'll give you just, now that we're all Zooming, we have to endure these awkward moments of silence as people search to unmute themselves. Let me, let me just give you guys a moment to think. And um, we, we certainly will come back to you if you don't want to hop in now. This is also the chance when I've asked the organizers to put up a poll question. Because we wanted to find out, you as an audience, what you're working on. And there's the poll question about adaptation planning. Have you been involved in adaptation planning in support of economic development? And you can make any number of choices. Okay, super. Will we see those poll results either now or, or in a little bit? Well, there we go. It looks like many of you have been involved in adaptation planning in some of the main sectors, agriculture, tourism, about a third, and then small and medium in, in enterprises and infrastructure and because this is multiple choice, um, many of you are involved in additional ones. This, not knowing all of the work that you're all doing, my guess is that a lot of these things are like our panelists have said, complementary and overlapping. It may be the tourism and infrastructure, agriculture and infrastructure, water delivery um, that provide key inputs for small and medium enterprises. Um, that my hunch is that many of you probably are involved across sectors, which again harkens back to at least some of the things Lee, for example, mentioned about the need to integrate and, and understand how adaptation plans can, can plan for many, uh, many sectors rather than just a siloed approach. Possible, possible topic for discussion. Okay, wonderful. Well, in addition to the thoughts and questions that you're gathering, we invite people to go ahead and put your questions or comments in the chat box now as we go along. We have about 40 more minutes. We have two discussants who I'm gonna pull in now to um, maybe share some additional thoughts and respond to Lee, uh, Mary Kim, Yi Hong, and Simon's initial um, comments. And then, of course, we are, we're really excited to pull all of you experts in from our audience. So let me go to our first discussant. Um, and now we're excited to hear from Christina Martinez, who's a senior specialist on environment and decent work at ILO. And Christina, I've had the pleasure to be exposed to some of the work um, of the ILO on environment and decent work. We're really excited. We've already heard a little bit about um, creating green jobs and investing in resilience. Excited to hear your responses to the panelists, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And 
Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's uh, really very exciting to be with, uh, with you, and it's a pleasure for the International Labour Organization to participate in this important forum and discussion. The session today has been, uh, or is actually quite uh, very interesting, uh, with important points. Many of them we have heard about reflections on adaptation planning and climate action particularly regarding infrastructure adaptation, which is a very important um, um, action and, and climate action. But we know that there is also a human-centered approach that Simon um, highlighted, and you just did as well. So let me make three points in um, addressing the human-centered approach. My first point is that, is that we must not forget that jobs are a source of dignity. And this is for every country from any stage of development, from any of us and from anybody that is uh, working at this moment or is willing to work. The decent work agenda and the labor standards needs to be at the center of climate resilience actions. So when we talk about green jobs, we're talking about jobs that are good for the environment, are good for the economy, and are good for people. They need to be uh, quality, decent jobs, and in line with the four strategic objectives at the heart of the decent work agenda. And I just want to mention these four objectives, and I want you to think through, do I have this as a fundamental uh, principle and, and, and uh, part of the decent work agenda. So the first one, jobs that set and promote standards and fundamental principles and rights at work. Second one, create jobs that create greater opportunities for women and men to decent employment and income. The third principle, enhance the coverage and effectiveness of social protection for all. And the fourth one, a strengthen tripartite and social dialogue. So these are the four uh, pillars that uh, all UN member countries um, um, are committed to, and the jobs that um, um, that we, we need to have in all countries need to, uh, to, uh, to to commit to as well. My second point is that adaptation planning in economic sectors is a process of just transition. And in this process, we want many green jobs outcomes. We want these decent quality jobs that I just mentioned before. So a just transition rich in green jobs will not happen automatically, but it will happen by design. And that's why it's so important that international organizations, development banks, uh, our governments, workers and employers join forces for this design. And we need to understand the detail of the design. For example, which occupations are lacking or need to be updated for adaptation planning in your country? And how to ensure workers, especially youth, have the right skills to meet the demand for green jobs? If we look at the Asia Pacific region, we, we know that more than eight in every 10 workers are in either low skills occupation or medium skills occupation. The medium skills occupations are almost 60, more than 65% of all um, the occupations. Many countries, and sorry, and the low skills occupations uh, can be 16% uh, or, or more depending on the country. Many countries in Asia um, are going to experience and are experiencing already a surplus of low level skills increasing by 2030. And skill shortages will continue to increase, particularly for jobs require, requiring highly skilled workers. A skill shortages already presents a major harder for the just energy transition, for example particularly for certain sectors and occupation, such as wind, wave, and tidal power, 
and renewable energies for manufacturing, construction, and installation. So we need to pay attention to this detail and to plan for these occupations to be able to be um, uh, integrated in the curriculum in the countries, in the education institutions, in the um, vocational education and training plans, and to have uh, workers' organizations and employers' organizations also offering um, skills upgrades. The just transition adaptation planning uh, needs to address the reform of education systems and the lack of teachers and trainers in areas that are going to be in need, such as the renewable energies. And to do this horizontal policy coordination across ministries of education, labor, and environment, uh, we also need uh, to have um, um, an adaptation plan, let's say. My third and final point is that adaptation planning requires understanding the social impacts and this can only be achieved by tripartism. And this word that is sometimes difficult to pronounce means that workers and employers organizations discuss together with governments to understand the needs for the economic planning process and the needs for building resilience. Planning for, for the just transition requires substantial efforts by, by uh, these bodies, governments, national, regional, and local level um, um, structures, employers, and workers. And the success lies in the coordination mechanisms as well as on the social dialogue approach to make these structural uh, changes work at the ground level in a transformative uh, way. How we can assist uh, uh, with this uh, challenge um, we have the guidelines, the ILO guidelines for a just transition that were prepared by uh, member countries with um, um, the workers and employers organizations, so in a tripartite uh, mechanism. And they offer nine areas of policy and strategic intervention that adaptation planners can explore and utilize. Uh, thank you, Coco. Well, Christina, this brings in such a complementary set of, of perspectives. Really appreciate um, what you've had to say. Just to quote, actually, this isn't a quote, but what I thought you said was that um, green and decent jobs are a cornerstone of adaptation and a just transition. And that's that's what we all want, right? That's what we're looking for, for that resilient and, and good future that we can all look forward to. Thank you so much. And what a perfect introduction. It's so great. Each one of you speakers are actually setting the ground for the next person. Um, and this Iris um, Kalawag is our rounding out panelist. And then we're going to have an interactive discussion with all of you. But what a perfect place to kind of wrap up our panel. Um, because Iris, in a way, I don't know if you would say this, but you, you are part of the youth, meaningful youth engagement, you're a specialist for the meaningful youth engagement at the Asian Development Bank. And it's actually our youth who for us represent our brightest hope and for whom and with whom we're trying to build a resilient future, even with climate change. So this is a perfect place. We're excited to hear about your comments, please. Thanks, Coco. And thanks to the organizers of the forum for inviting information for, to, to this session. Um, I thought that given the discussions we've been having, it's really, really timely that we're bringing young people into these spaces. Um, and just echoing Christina, um, adaptation plans and need to put people at the center and to do so get in the perspectives and inputs of those who will be affected on a day-to-day -day basis by these plans will be important. So in terms of what changes need to happen, the way we plan our adaptation strategies and economic sectors, we'll really need to recognize that young people are legitimate stakeholders with a significant stake and contribution to climate adaptation and resilience. Our research with the ILO in 2020 
confirm previous knowledge that young people were among the most vulnerable to shocks and stresses, including the economic fallout that tend to happen with natural disasters and even health-related um, crisis like the COVID-19 pandemic. We are headed to a skills and employment challenge, just echoing Christina again, one with potentially devastating consequences for young people in the region. Um, and we may be struggling with the fact that young people will not be able to easily access the opportunities they need to transition successfully into a greener world of work. But at the same time, we know that young people provide unique contributions in the form of knowledge, action, and voice that help inform the development of more targeted interventions, acquire hard to access data, and innovatively solve adaptation challenges. This ranges from the way young people show leadership on the ground by leveraging technology and social enterprises to support the social and economic needs of communities during a disaster, to working with like local governments to collect data to inform future thinking, planning, and response strategies. One concrete way young people have contributed to evidence-based planning is in research, monitoring, and evaluation. In 2018, ADD Youth for Asia and the Team Energy Foundation mobilized young people from Silaki Island um, in the Philippines to conduct m and &E activities in support of an off-grid electrification project. Since monitoring and maintaining the power system is likely to be a source of problem in remote island communities, engaged young people are able to bridge that critical communication gap between government agencies and communities on the ground. In this context, young people provide insights, for example, on education, health, and livelihood needs that should be taken into consideration um, in planning processes. Youth, for example, have different characteristics, and this may easily be taken for granted or overlooked in planning processes. So their capacity to gather data on specific indicators such as age, gender, disability, and other criteria for vulnerability would help planners access and design right to size strategies based on these unique insights. Um, so in the context of the island, for example, what young women and young men use energy for, what their needs are going to be, and how female-led or male-led households will be able to access electricity and communicate problems related to access issues to, to, decision, to government authorities will really matter when we're thinking about how the plans that we're making operationalize on the ground. Um, but given the importance young people do provide to the planning process, what, what can we do to mobilize youth in this process per se. So working with young people will require more innovative, future-looking ways of collaboration. They struggle with being seen as equal partners in the process and struggle with economic forms, of, uh, with tokenistic forms of engagement, where their insights and contributions are either not taken seriously or simply unheard. So to, be mo to mobilize you, being intentional about and even designing at the very early stages of the process, young people's participation will already be a good starting point. So there are three recommendations I have for, for people in today's session. Number one, when we're mapping stakeholders to engage in the early stages of the planning process, include youth organizations and networks who are working on the ground, whether you will find them through asking CSOs or working with local governments, identify them. Knowing who they are at the beginning will be able to determine how you're going to engage them throughout the process. The second is to provide resources and capacity support to youth organizations and networks to effectively engage planning processes at all levels. And this is going to be really important when we're talking about young people from vulnerable and marginalized groups like young women, young people with disabilities, rural youth, and even indigenous youth who tend to be excluded in these planning spaces in favor of more articulate, educated youth living in urban areas, despite being the more vulnerable subgroups to climate change. In fact, Finally, as policymakers, uh, we will need to look at how we can champion positive ways of working with young people and valuing the knowledge and inputs that they provide. Um, in, in climate change discussions, we talk about the bias on expert knowledge versus indigenous and local knowledge. And this easily extends to youth knowledge, which is less valued because it is perceived to lack the academic rigor or the maturity that expert developed studies are based on. We know from our experience working with young people on the ground that this really isn't the case and that there are contributions there um, that help deepen the impact that our planning strategies provide. Um, thanks, Coco. Well, thank you so much. And everyone, 
um, that, that kind of has been a tour de force of adaptation planning, investments, looking to the horizon and asking what do we need to be resilient in the short, medium and long term. And our last two panelists, Christina and, and also you, Inez, have really helped us think about why we're doing all of this, which is for us, for people. And, um, and that's really what all of our work on adaptation plans and adaptation and resilience investment is about. I also misspoke earlier. We have just seven minutes for a discussion and it's all too short. I beg your pardon for my faulty timekeeping, um, but would invite any of you who want to post a question in the chat to go ahead and do so. Um, and also, if any of you as speakers would like to, to converse with each other, that's also these next few moments are the time to do that. To save time while you're thinking about um, comments that you might want to make. And to save time, I will summarize and put concluding remarks in the chat. I'm just prioritizing you since I think you're very important and you need just a few minutes of, of air time. So the time is, um, is for you. You can also raise your hand if you, if you wish. I'm just checking if anyone has their hand raised. Oh, we don't have the raise hand function turned on. Ah, okay. Then should I um, any of the any of the organizers, do you see any questions in the chat that you'd like to pose to our speakers? If not, I have I have one or the other question. So here's a question to Christina and Lee and Mary Kim. All three of you mentioned different aspects of key sectors, as well as um, key people who are employed in those sectors like tourism. How do you bring together employers or employees, adaptation plans, and finance? Do any of you have any insights? And it's kind of a, a hard question, but how do you bring together the actual adaptation plans the investment and the people who work in key sectors. Should I go first? Madam sure. Chair? This is a, an excellent question because uh, the devil is in the detail, isn't it? And uh, I think it's also, it goes very well with um, the focus of this, this session. I think the, the, the secret recipe is the planning and design. So when we um, design uh, for adaptation planning, it's not just about the uh, end result, it's about the process. And on that process is giving a voice, giving a voice to those that can reach other voices. And these are, you know, governments, they, they actually reach uh, many other stakeholders. They are the employers, because at the end of the day, employment is generated by employers, SMEs, also big firms, and they are the workers, the workers that are in the day to day pushing and actually making these uh, adaptation action plans happen on the ground. And that process where every um, part of, in, in the case of the ILO, that is a tripartite organization, every part has a voice, equal voice, is what we call tripartite, and requires um, substantial planning. So it's no a process where you rush, it's a process where you seek consensus. But, and I will finish with this, uh, Madam Coco, when we see social dialogue happening, we also see the implementation being successful. And that is the, the, the difference that the, the process of discussion, agreement, 
and planning, the just transition planning uh, requires time for discussion and times for the voices to be represented. But then we see um, more successful um, outcomes in the longer term. That is something that Simon already also reflected on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And that, that also reflects, um, Bob put the question in the Q&A box um, that really links actually, Mary Kim, you and, and what you're saying now, Christina, about the need for making sure that it, the local communities who aren't left behind, who do benefit. Mary, can you talk about what you're doing in the tourism sector? Any reflections? As well, Simon and, and Lee, um, Ines, if you have additional questions, and Yihong, or comments. Thanks very much, Coco. Um, I guess in the tourism sector, there are there what we have found through our research and work is that there is um, a big there is a spectrum of employees and employers in the tourism sector. So we have the the big hotel chains uh, and the workers in them. We have tourism operators, some that are big businesses while um, others are not. And then we have the informal sector who are artisans or food suppliers and um, informal tourism operators. So we've noticed that this has highlighted um, social protection issues that have come up in the broad um, with the impacts of COVID-19 and the need to um, to respond to the to the broader um, needs of women and economic empowerment of women and girls, because it, it is often them who are employed in the informal sector. And then, so there, so this has um, prompted um, the need to look at um, tourism um, through both um, an immediate term lens and then um, more longer term. And that's where we can do um, the concerted planning in conversations with locals, with domestic governments, um, with regional partner organization partners um, and with development partners, international development partners. So in the immediate term, um, people need to maintain their incomes or not at the level they were when they were fully employed, but um, we need to think about what that means. And so in tourism, lots of people have gone back to, have moved from the cities where that, that are the centers of tourism and moved to home villages and um, engaged in agriculture and um, any work that they can get to make ends meet. Um, you would have seen, you may have seen that in Fiji, for example, Facebook has exploded with um, tasks and um, for bartering services, for food, services for services. And that has really helped bring the community together while people think of creative ways to um, be gainfully employed while also getting um, services back that they need. So there was a, I can think of an example where a woman um, needed her roof fixed and she um, was a smallholder farmer and she advertised for someone to be paid in um, uh, taro. And that has sparked a, a, that kind of, of services and food and exchange and bartering, um, bartering in the community again. But then in the long term, we need to think about um, how to prepare um, for tourism returning in the next few years, hopefully, and how we manage that while also ensuring that incomes can be sustained in the interim. So this can be training and preparing um, for tourism to come back and, uh, and and doing those things that I talked about earlier to, to build back better. Yeah, thank you so much. Everyone, um, I noticed, Hong, uh, you have your hand up and our time is spent. 
maybe just a very quick, um, and Yihan, there's clearly so much to talk about, but we don't want to leave without, without hearing from you. Very quickly, could you hop in? Thanks. And then everyone will conclude our session. Thank you, Coco. Just just want to quickly share my personal reflection on your, on your excellent question on linking the planning and, and investment. So I think as many panelists has talked about, I think there's a huge investment need towards adaptation, I think, in, in many sectors or countries or in, in the region. Uh, so I would suggest there needs to be certain, um, you know, through some vulnerability assessment or some certain process need to prioritize certain sectors, even among the sectors, which projects shall be prioritized so that, you know, it, this really all the investments can achieve this, this goal in, in, a, in a local or regional context. So that, that's uh, my first uh, uh, thought. So it's a prioritization is, it would be important given the, the huge requirements on the investments. And second, I, I would also like to stress again, the, the private sector angle is that, uh, uh, you know, like ad adaptation project is often characterized as um, have limited uh, um, returns and also uh, the, the, the steady uh, cash flows uh, during the operation. Uh, so I, I would suggest that it's in, it very important to involve the private sector in the planning process uh, so that to enhance the bankability of the, of the adapt, adaptation projects. And also for the investment and the financing, uh, clearly that public sector can not offer enough uh, resources to finance all these uh, investments. So it's critical to crowd in the, the private sector capital in the adaptation field through innovative financial instruments such as you know blended financing, uh, public-private partnership, or, or land value capturing. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, everyone, we could talk about this all day long. Thank you so much to our panelists for sharing your experiences and your expertise. It has been a pleasure to spend this time with you today at the ATEM Forum. And for our audience, thanks for staying with us just a few minutes over time. My name is Coco Warner. It's been my pleasure to moderate this joint session between the Asian Development Bank and the UNFCCC. We hope that you all have a really great rest of the ATEM Forum this week and keep sharing your adaptation lessons as we Hopefully, as we try to build a resilient future together. Thanks, everybody, and take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Coco, for moderating. Thank you. Thank you for attending today's session as part of the 7th Asia-Pacific Climate Change Adaptation Forum. Please join us for the technical sessions beginning at 2 p.m. Bangkok time, focusing on inclusive and nature-based resiliences. You can find the link to join these sessions by returning to the sessions tab on the APAN Forum Conference community on Hubilo. Within the community, you can also explore the exhibitions as well as chat or set up meetings with other conference attendees. Join the conversation on social media using the hashtag APAN2020. Thank you once again for your participation and see you in the next sessions.